I'll give you a twenty. I'll give you five minutes before, okay. and I'll tell you when you're up. Okay. Um, I'll just introduce you first. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you I haven't had a chance to meet personally, uh, my name is Dr Peter Chen from the Centre for Public Policy. Um, I'm the guy who's been sending you all those pesky emails lately. Uh, welcome to our 1.30 session. Uh, I have an apology from uh, Matthew Allen who was giving a uh, paper on e-governance, uh, the digital divide and citizenship. He apologises to us all. He's unable to make it and hopes to, um, to see you at the next event. Um, so our two speakers who will have uh, for 30 minutes each, back to back, and then we'll have questions at the end if that's okay uh, with you. Uh, first is uh, Ms. Alison Orr, yes, I was right, uh, who will be talking on the use and misuse of concepts in uh, e-democracy discourse, followed by Associate Professor Richard Joseph, who will be talking about the, uh, the limits of electronic government, uh, the value of an information perspective. So, without further ado. Yep. 
Hi, as Peter just said, my name is Alison Orr. I'm a postgraduate, a PhD student at the University of New South Wales in the School of Politics and International Relations. And I'm going to speak today on the um, debate surrounding the concept of democracy and the other related concepts in that conceptual constellation and um, that are in the e-democracy discourse. Uh, I'll be... It's quite theoretical. I've been listening to a lot of papers so far today and they've been pretty practical. This is going to be reasonably theoretical. So um, I'll try to get through it as, as quickly as I can. I've cut back on a lot of the um, examples from the discourse. If you want to question me on them about them later or if you want to know who they are or any of the dates or anything, just let me know. Um, most of the examples, uh, they all come from referee journals in uh, political science referee journals um, and most of them are examples from the last five years. Um, the main idea that I'm going to be talking about is looking at the conflicting arguments that are coming forth or that have been around the idea of the effect that the internet is going to have on democracy and democratic institutions. As the technology is becoming more increasingly integrated into our lives and into our political systems, the, the conflicting and varied um, forecasts that the technology is going to bring to our democracies are increasing and becoming far more complex. There's general agreement that the internet opens up new possibilities for politics, but there's almost no agreement on what, that, on what those possibilities will mean, or if any of the innovations that are intended to bring about uh, a reinvigoration of democracy will actually have that effect. Most of, most of the arguments, generally speaking, can fall into, well, I'm putting them into positive and negative. This is very general because most of the arguments fall right across the democratic theoretical spectrum. But there are two sides, the advocates and the detractors. And I'll just go through them quickly because most people know largely what the arguments are. Firstly, the idea that the internet is a gift for democracy. Internet advocates believe that it's going to enhance democracy and enhance citizen participation. It'll, it can't possibly allow for a more direct form of uh, government through the use of binding online polls and plebiscites, online voting, those sorts of things. There's also the argument that it could provide greater access to information for citizens in a parliamentary system, which will in turn lead to greater transparency and accountability as the citizens um, access that information and develop better political judgment by using that information. It can also be of benefit to civil society groups who can use the technology to build far more effective movements, particularly on a global level, and which may help to offset the power of uh, multinational corporations and perhaps even nation states. On the other side, the internet detractors are saying that the internet, far from actually enhancing democracy, is going to undermine our current democratic processes and institutions. And um, instead of uh, bringing about a direct form of democracy, what it will actually bring about is a form of plebiscitary dictatorship or the tyranny of the majority. Um, it is also argued that the increased uh, power on behalf of political groups in civil society will be at the expense of more traditional forms of representation and forms of participation like parliament and that are accountable to the people. The main argument that I'm putting forward in this paper is that the conflicting opinions don't really reflect conflicting ideas about the technology itself, but are actually a reflection of the conflicting and contested nature of the concept of democracy. Um, the, they are reflecting an, a new argument, a, a, new, a renewed debate on old arguments. They're bringing up the same old expectations and problems that democracy has had for thousands of years. They're not new arguments. The conflict is arising because democracy is an essentially contested concept. So I'll just quickly go through what an essentially contested concept actually means. The concept of democracy is not a process, a result of a straight line of political thinking across thousands of years. It has mean, meant many different things in different times, different cultures and different places and it is now an absolutely incredibly broad term. Any attempt to grasp uh, 
uh, fixed definition of what democracy means is further complicated by the fact that democracy has become so value laden and as Sartori, Giovanni Sartori has described it, it is a universally honorific word. Everybody wants to describe themselves as a democrat. Everybody wants to say that their actions are democratic. We're seeing it even in the world at the moment. Any action that is seen as pursuing democracy somehow has an aura of legitimacy on it because it's using that concept. Because the concept is so value-laden, people find it very useful to add different criteria or remove different criteria or focus on certain parts of the concept that backs up their own assertion. At the same time, others will resist the removal or addition of criteria to the concept and it just continually becomes far more complex and conflicted. When a concept is internally consistent, when it has relatively open rules of application, like democracy, and when it is an appraisive term, so that using the concept actually gives something value, it doesn't just describe what it is, then the concept is described as an essentially contested concept. And such a concept, for such a concept, the uh, conflict and complexity is an uh, essential and persistent feature in its functioning in language. And democracy is such a concept. And this, of course, means that the endless, it involves endless disputes about what the term actually means. The disagreement over the effects of the Internet on democracy are tied up into this con con conceptual conflict. Giovanni Sartori, again, says that the debate over the word, the concept of democracy is a war of words. After the Marshall War finished in 1945, he argues that the conceptual, the war of the words started and the idea of winning this war was to conquer the good words, the value words that he wanted and sell the bad words into the enemy camp. And this has been ongoing with the concept of democracy and e-democrats and people advocating for the use of democracy, the use of the internet in our political systems have actually stepped into this war and I've I'm arguing that I'm not sure that they're entirely aware that they're, they're involved in it. And they're also taking sides, um, again, without seeming to actually justify why or even um, admit that they are. In the claims put forward for internet democracy, there's very little discussion on broad democratic theory. Writers generally use a particular set of what they believe democracy to mean and then they provide the evidence to show that that is actually having a beneficial effect on that form of democracy. The essentially contested nature of the concept of democracy allows writers to pick and choose from what they want and therefore to actually have a rather biased way of describing what it is that their innovations or their forecast is going to mean for democracy. There's little attempt to justify the use of certain criteria. Mostly what a writer does is just assume that their model of democracy is correct and then they go on from there without justifying why it's so. By ignoring the complexity of the concept of democracy, <coughs> advocates are um, arguing that technology can actually solve old political problems and that democracy is something that can be easily fixed with technology. In this discourse, on the positive side, there are three main arguments, and I'm just going to go into each of those um, in turn and look at the theory up against them. The first one is that the internet is going to strengthen groups in civil society. The second is that the internet will allow citizens direct decision making powers and thirdly that the internet's capacity to increase the, available, the availability and the access to politically relevant information will encourage citizen participation and therefore reinvigorate parliamentary democracy. These are the three main arguments that come up in the e-democracy discourse. As I said before though, the claims are made generally, there are of course some very fine exceptions, but mostly speaking they are made in a theoretical vacuum. It becomes difficult to assess the validity of the writer's claims um, and because they're using a very reduced idea of democracy, their claims appear on first reading to be very straightforward and quite elementary. But when you put it against other models of democracy or try to bring in a conflicting part, a conflicting criteria of the same concept, uh, it, it very quickly becomes evident that the conflict is not coming from the technology, it's coming from 
how they're using and how they're applying the concept of democracy. So the first claim, groups and the internet. The, it's very commonly expected, and some are arguing that it's already happened, is happening, that the internet is of great benefit to groups in civil society. Protest groups, NGOs and other non-state actors are using the tools of the internet to build up very effective and powerful um, movements across borders that can actually rival the power of multinational corporations or nation states. Many civil society groups are finding that they're able to act in a way that they would not have otherwise been able to. They can use technology to do stuff that, they would, that simply wasn't available to them before because most of these groups act within limited resources and, and limited budgets. Some groups, such as Greenpeace, have actually developed the idea of the cyber activist, which allows a person to become involved in the political system without actually really doing anything. So it's decreasing the costs for an individual to become involved in the political process in terms of time and effort, which is one of the most valuable things people have these days and why they don't become involved in politics, I would imagine. Writers in the e-democracy discourse are very enthusiastic about the effect that this is going to have. They believe that the internet is a means for amplifying and revitalising the power of grassroots movements and that it may even challenge the existing monopoly of nation states. Peter Krauss states that in the public sphere of the World Wide Web, the former technological have-nots are for the first time equal communication partners in the electronic agora. Jeffrey Ayres, in his article about how NGOs brought down the multinational agreement on investment, states that the internet is bringing about a revolution in the dynamics of popular contention and that it's provided groups with greater capacity to contribute to a contentious campaign, particularly at the international level. Harry Cleaver, in his article describing how the Zapatistas are using information technology, states that governments are becoming increasingly concerned by the ability of NGO networks to mobilise opposition and that this concern is mostly derived from their use of information technology. Writers claiming that the internet is helping grassroots movements to become more powerful are bringing to prominence the democratic theory of pluralism. For pluralists, the capacity of groups to limit and disperse power in society is an imperative criteria of democracy. So for them, any means that will strengthen group power and help to disperse the power of a nation state um, is an improvement. The enthusiasm um, is quite abundant for many writers. Um, people arguing that for the first time in history the forces of peace and environmental preservation have resources that were once only in the league of the military, government and corporations. And it's argued that this is being almost single-handedly brought about by their use of the technology. A view like this can only be held by someone who is advocating pluralism. It's not ever justified why an unrepresentative civil society group should somehow um, be able to circumvent the wishes or the decisions of an elected representative parliament. For a person who believes that parliament and representation is an essential criteria of democracy, this would be seen as grossly undemocratic. Enthusiasm for the increased power of groups is not a statement on the effect of the internet on democracy. It's a statement on how they view democracy itself. And it's disregarding the complexity of democracy. It's allowing the argument to be made by simply following a particular, by choosing the criteria of the, from the democratic concept that uh, proves their argument. The claim that the internet is a benefit to civil society groups is actually a valid one. There are a lot of civil society groups that have benefited from the use of the technology and they are doing things that they would never have been able to do and it is allowing a lot more people to get involved through online activism or getting involved in websites and allowing them to have control over their message by publishing stuff on the internet which they didn't previously have. However, when we ask the question, is it good for democracy? we can see that it's actually a far more complex question than it would, have, it would have first appear. 
The answer will depend not on how we forecast the technology will affect these, the institutions and in our political system, but it will actually be predicated on how we interpret democracy, what criteria are we using to interpret democracy. It can be e easy to argue something to be of benefit when you already know the outcome from the very beginning because you've already picked the criteria against which it will be evaluated. The second claim uh, is that the internet can bring about a more direct form of democracy. The internet provides the, techn the technological capacity to allow people to become involved in consultative processes with the government. They can run um, petitions, plebiscites, um, all sorts of things. I'm just going to read anything at the moment. Um, and the idea is that this, in the future, may become binding so that governments be can become increasingly responsive by being able to continually consult with the citizens. And again, there is a lot of enthusiasm about this idea. The, these writers in this particular argument tend to argue that direct democracy is real democracy. It is the most ideal form of democracy. And they argue that any other type of democracy has been brought about simply as a compromise situation to overcome the um, purely practical problems inherent in direct democracy. Such a writer is Gordon Graham, who in the Internet of Philosophical Inquiry claims that the Internet is going to gap, bridge the gap between representative and direct democracy. Roger Clark states that um, it will make geographic distances no longer a problem as they were when China set up a direct democracy in the past and this, the Internet will allow a process where major policy decisions can be decided by direct democracy. In the Electronic Republic, Lawrence Grossman agrees that the communications technology will overcome some of the problem, practical problems of democracy. He proposes that an electronic republic will be, more, will be a more direct form of government, which would be intensely, intensely responsive to the people. Contrary to this, of course, are all the writers who believe that this will bring about a plebiscitary dictatorship and bring about the tyranny of the majority. Again, showing the conflicting nature of democracy. There isn't any doubt in anyone's mind that the internet can actually provide the tools. The technology is not in doubt. There is, there are, is now a means for people to directly, um, for the government to directly consult with the people. But, as in the previous example, people who are arguing this fail to do it within a theoretical framework. It's simply assumed that direct democracy is just the best form of, of government. By failing to justify their claims within a, a theoretical framework and by ignoring the complexity of democracy, those advocating direct democracy through the internet aren't answering the questions that are actually vital to this model of democracy. Representative parliamentarianism was not uh, developed simply as a means to overcome practical obstacles in the model. The model has many other problems, such as complexity, um, and, of course, the big one, the tensions between the majority and the minority. When looking through the literature on, in democratic theory, it's actually very hard to find anyone who will attest to the superiority of direct democracy as the best form of, of democracy or the best form of government. There is no mechanism in a true direct democracy to hinder the majority from par passing legislation that is detrimental to a minority. This problem has been the obstacle to the development of direct democracy and it's been a major influence in how our own systems that are currently in place have been developed. For centuries, the idea of the tyrannous majority has played an important role in developing representative democracy. Two other final points um, that arise due to a simplified understanding of democracy, um, of the concept of democracy in this discourse is firstly that the classical ideal of direct democracy involved high levels of interaction among the citizens and this is not often mentioned by advocates of direct democracy despite the fact that the internet actually provides great tools to allow this to happen. 
Secondly, a true direct democracy would allow people to become involved in setting the agenda, not just passively voting on options that are provided to them by the leadership. And again, this is something that really isn't discussed in this discourse. As I said, the technical capacity is not in question. The, the internet does provide these tools. The only thing that is in question is whether this will be a positive development. The technology can't really overcome the problems within the models of democracy themselves, particularly this one. The problems of direct democracy have been discussed and argued for several centuries. The idea that a new form of technology can come along and fix millennia of problems is just ridiculous. <laughs> um, it ignores the complexity of the model in general and it it tries to overcome problems, of political problems, with technological solutions, which history has shown never really works. The final claim to be examined is that the internet's capacity to facilitate citizens' access to politically relevant information is a possible way to reinvigorate or re-legitimise parliamentary democracy. Increased information is often associated with democracy and is one of the criteria but to understand it simply as increased democracy, increased information equals increased democracy, is a severely reduced understanding of the concept of democracy. Again, people are very excited about the idea of what the internet can do for parliamentary democracy. Um, it's argued that through political information on websites, the citizens will become increasingly informed. They will develop better political judgment by doing this, and they'll be able to hold their leaders to account by, by having a greater idea of what they're doing and being able to question them on it. Um, it's argued that information coupled, coupled to effective communication provides the lifeblood, lifeblood of democracy and that the there is a possibility that the current disenchantment, disenchantment with the political process in Western democracies could be due to a crisis in communication and therefore... Uh, using information technology will help re-legitimise and reinvigorate democracy. Um, it's also argued, uh, Kirsty Magary in 99 argued that Australia's embrace of the internet to provide information to its citizens has enhanced its democratic processes which in order to flourish depend on the availability of information. She doesn't explain how democracy is enhanced simply by providing more information there is no guarantee that anyone's going to read it, nor is there any reason to assume that increased information of itself leads to better political judgment in citizens or will spontaneously lead to people participating in the political process. There's no doubt that it is the use of political websites does make it easier for a citizen to be more involved, to, to be more informed. It's now easier for a person to find out who their local member is what they voted on, what they said in Parliament. All those things are now online, which would have been far more difficult to gain in the past. However, there are, of course, a lot of problems in arguing that this in itself will enhance democracy. The main problem, again, because it's not addressed within a theoretical framework, it fails to address the theoretical problems within the model. It fails to address the significant problem in the representative system, which is that people have to give up their right to govern to someone else. The greater information can allow the electorate to follow what the representative is doing, um, but it cannot ensure that that representative is truly representative. Um, in either the Stephen Common put forward two ways to represent, neither of those could be satisfied simply by a person being more informed. There is no way to know truly that they are doing what they said they were going to do or representing in a way that they said they were going to do simply because you have more information. There are no, within our current democratic, our parliamentary system, there is no mechanism to remove a representative who ceases to be representative simply on those grounds or who has gone back on their words since being elected. Information provided on political websites will allow a person to be more involved, informed but it can't change the fact that you can't remove people who aren't representing you between elections. 
If citizens don't feel that they're being adequately represented, represented by current representatives, being informed is really not going to help that. It's not going to make it better. No amount of information can reinvigorate democracy of itself. There's also um, a problem of information overload. The idea that information, the idea that information can fix democracy implies that the problem in democracy is a lack of information. Um, there is, all, there is the possibility that increased in, uh, levels of information can be negative. The government can use it to just throw lots, millions of bits of information at you so you are totally unable to wade through it all and to find what is relevant and what is not. And I do think that some of the websites you see that have so much information on them, sometimes I wonder if they are trying to do that because it's just too much and you just can't uh, follow it all. The claim that increased information can enhance democracy is based on a very diminished understanding of democracy. Again, it's taking concepts, criteria, out of an essentially contested concept and using it to argue their own point. There's no attempt to adequately um, examine the problems within the system itself in order to determine how it best can be reinvigorated. Failing to understand democracy in its theoretical framework means that if we take the easy road, we feel like we're fixing a problem, but actually we may not be actually making any difference at all. Sorry, it's like a lecture, isn't it? Finishing now. <laughs> Although the technical capacity uh, of the internet to facilitate greater um, direct involvement for citizens to enhance international movements of global of civil society groups. None of this is in question. It all can be done. The internet definitely provides those tools and they're very, it's very exciting to see the effect that it's having. Some of it will be positive but the idea that all of it is positive and these little things can just fix democracy overnight is an exaggeration and it's continually there throughout the discourse. Right as in this um, area are so enamoured of the technology that they fail to really examine the theories, the political theories that are behind them all. And because of this, they overlook some of the fundamental problems that underlie democracy itself. Just as a final thought, the, the reason that I'm interested in this is because I think it's important to remember that democracy is such an, it's, it's like a balancing act and it's been developed over several thousands of years and while the system we, don't, we have now is definitely not perfect, we don't want to actually make it worse and by arguing that certain changes will fix particular problems, it may upset the balance and go overboard in one particular area. The, the, the idea of essentially, the essentially contested nature of the concept means that it is internally conflictual and highly complex. And because of this, the idea that technology can fix something that is so complex um, is grossly exaggerated. If we upset the balance, we may end up with a worse democracy. And I think that the idea, the, the, the main point is there's not enough theoretical there's not enough discussion going on within a theoretical framework in this discourse and because of that, stuff that seems very straightforward and easy on the surface, when you delve into it a bit more, it's actually far more complex and that's why we're seeing so many conflicting and varied forecasts for e-democracy. Thank you very much, and uh, now we'll uh, introduce uh, Richard Joseph. I have your PowerPoint, do I? Uh, it be yep.
Thanks very much. Peter, um, I'm actually trying today to... Okay, okay. Yeah. Trying today to perhaps talk to this paper rather than um, uh, just to give you a flavour of what I've actually written written here. Um, on the way here, uh, my sister-in-law said to me, uh, she said, what are, you, what are you doing to talk on? And I said, well, it's, it's about... Uh, about e-government and I didn't expect the response her immediate response was she said oh she said, I hope it's better than the government we've already got <laughs> sort of stopped me a bit and I realised that that's not what I was on about it didn't even allow me to tell her what you know I was going to ready to launch into a, a sort of a, a run of my paper it didn't, didn't work like that um, in fact uh, I've been quite welcomed by the fact that people have been talking about democracy I've spent 10 years working as a public servant in Canberra and uh, it's amazing in those 10 years I suddenly realised how little one thought about democracy in fact one didn't uh, in fact it sort of dawned on me now I actually wrote a PhD uh, about symbolic politics in Australian policy making and uh, it's exactly that level of acquiescence that agreement that we're trying to encourage from people we're not trying to allow democratic processes it, it, I'm quite encouraged by people thinking about democracy but in fact even for this paper thoughts of democracy didn't enter didn't enter my mind if, for those of you who don't know symbolic politics is a, um, a sort of I suppose a theoretical approach to the way governments sort of demonstrate legitimacy to populaces and use, through the use of symbolic, symbolic concepts such as words and language and uh, they, they actually generate acquiescence and from time to time acquiescence breaks down and when acquiescence breaks down you have riots in the streets and people sort of burning buildings but that's, that's a phenomenon from the 60s and it's still very prevalent today but that's just an offshoot um, this paper um, reflects my personal interest in semantics and, and I play around with the word of e-government not so much as a term but as a semantic construct what are the promises of it is what I'm trying to get at here uh, I'll just move on to the structure of the paper. Uh, I picked the word limits of e-government. Those of you who might remember in the 80s, uh, John Passmore had a series of ABC um, programs called The Limits of Government. And I don't know, it was in the back of my mind, but it didn't form part of this paper. Uh, what was more pertinent to me was uh, a book written by the Nobel Prize winning author Kenneth Arrow, 1974. He wrote a book called The Limits of Organisation. And that was the book that uh, I think triggered triggered the title. Well worth a read. Uh, there's many challenging things in, um, in that book. Uh, little to do with democracy but a lot to do with organisation. Um, this paper semantically deals with at the outset the promises of e-government and those promises we can read every day of the week. We can read it this book, this paper, OECD is where I've targeted, the OECD. Last year I think it was a really neat book they put out called the e-government imperative. Um, worth looking at but yes and funnily enough if you looked at their promises it, it appears in the World Bank documents and it appears in the Western Australian Government documents and the same phrases are all there so that was where I started semantically what are they promising us what are they promising now the second point of this paper is ok we've got the promises up here should I be circumspect about these promises as a cynic I'm deeply cynical about government yes I am I'm very circumspect. My job today in half an hour is to convince you some reasons why we should be circumspect. That's all it is. That's what I'm doing. Some historical reasons and some philosophical reasons. All centred around the concept of information. That's where I'm coming from. Not democracy, information. Now look, that's a really, really difficult term to deal with. Really difficult. And I don't, I'm still struggling with the concept of information. Data, information and knowledge. But that's my problem, not yours. I'll deal with that a little bit today. The angle I take on this seems to me to be quite, well, from what I've heard so far in the conference, quite unusual. I actually look at the way policymakers interpret that word information and try and overlay it on the promises that the e government proponents are telling us. It's actually a matrix approach. I look at how information is perceived within government policymakers' minds and the impact that that has on what e-government will deliver to us. And by mapping that out, I actually develop a matrix which actually suggests to me that there are some very serious limits 
to what we can expect from e-government. Very fundamental and serious limits. Now, I know the keynote speaker this morning started on history and I applaud him for his positive outlook on where we can go. But I, I for my mind, my, my level of thinking, I keep coming up against limits. And it's from those limits that I think we'll see the future being constructed. So that's the, the political basis, if you like, or the theoretical angle which I'm trying to convince you of um, today. I have half an hour, don't I? So, right, I'm spitting this out. It's a bit like a lecture when you don't have enough notes. <laughs> I'm used to this. <laughs> okay. Here are the promises of e-government. Well, before I start that, I'll, I'll just go back a bit. I don't know. Arrow, th- this, this really intrigued me. Kenneth Arrow. He quotes the sage Rabbi Hillel. I'm not into um, rabbis or rabbinical thinking, but um, this was a really intriguing thought. Rabbi Hillel, I don't, I don't know who he is, but 1974, if I am not for myself, then who is for me? And if I am not for others, then who am I? And if not now, when? Now, I don't know, that rattled around in my, that goes around in my head many times. What it's simply saying is, there's a tension between ends and means in society. And I think that's fundamental. We all have particular personal objectives, but we have to subjugate those to the needs of society. I think that's a simple tension between the individual and the community, if you like, or the common good. And that's what, Al, uh, what uh, uh, Kenneth Arrow sort of starts with. And he says, look, this central problem of organisation is the problem between balance, the balancing act between ends and means. And his final point was, if not now, when, which is the time factor. And I'm, in this paper I introduced the question of time because time actually has a very important element in decision making. When we do something. Uh, becomes important and I think that's important for governments. So, so this paper starts with a very simple statement that we are involved in e-government in a struggle between ends and means and right in the middle of that is this thing called technology which is mediating ends and means. That's, that's the starting point for the limits of organisation and in this paper as well. And, and my point simply is that, that I think we've we've probably put too much emphasis. I think this is an emphasis that we've heard in a number of papers in this uh, conference already. Too much emphasis on technology to deliver, to deliver this and some reasons why we should be very circumspect on that. And um, we've also put too much emphasis probably on this question of how quickly it's going to happen. I personally feel that um, these, the OECD, when you look at its report, it, it talks about removing obstacles as if they're roadblocks in a road. After they're gone, we'll be able to go down this path and we'll get there. No, that's not the metaphor I like. It's a dangerous metaphor. I think the real metaphor is uh, an appreciation of the fact that some of these limits are rather obstinate. They're not roadblocks. They're much more permanent, much more entrenched and much more difficult to deal with. So those are the two criticisms that I wish to develop. For those of you who are involved in e-government, I suppose these are not new to you. These shouldn't be new, should they? These are the claims that the OECD puts out. Efficiency. ICTs, this is their their words, ICTs will enable efficiency, improvements in mass processing tasks and public admin operations. First point. E-government will improve services by providing a better customer focus and recognition of user requirements. Fair enough, second point. And uh, it goes on about uh, e-government will help stakeholders share information and ideas and contribute to specific policy outcomes such as information sharing in the health sector for example. So those things, they sound pretty straightforward. As I said, you'll find them in the World Bank reports you'll find them in OECD and you'll find them in our own uh, West Australian uh, government, uh, I think it's called the Office of E-Government in Western Australia and you'll find them in Australian government reports as well such as ones put out by NOE uh, until fairly recently. So that shouldn't be news to us. What do you think about these claims? Well, my answer to those are um, if that's a not unreasonable interpretation of E-Government should I be circumspect? Would I be reasonable in thinking that e-government is going to deliver better government. <coughs> well, 10 years in Canberra writing policy documents and looking at cabinet submissions and things convinces me that I should be very circumspect 
as to what the promises are. The promises are predominantly rhetorical in my opinion and I think, I think there's, and there's some reasons for this. Okay, let me convince you of that now. Let's go beyond the, the government reports into some straight convincing. I need to convince you about this. The first point of departure from the self is history. And as I said, the keynote speaker this morning, uh, Steve Coleman, I think, played on history very well and I, I think it was a nice thought. We ignore history at our peril. We continue to ignore it. And I think it's one of the amazing things in this field, particularly the technology field, how ahistorical we are. We think we've come... I mean, people, people believe that the information revolution started with the computer chip. I don't share that. The information revolution has an origin which predates that. Much earlier than that. So that's the first point of departure. This history thing. Well, a couple of issues to do with history. I've been a student of technological developments for many years, particularly in a policy angle. And what one notices is you get waves of technological enthusiasm. Now, that's not, that recently we had the dot-com boom. And then before that, we had uh, Paul Keating and the information to the highway. And prior to that, going back a little bit, this is showing my age, I'm pretty great, we had the high-tech boom of the 80s. High-tech boom and bust, with the, remember the big crash in 87? Uh, it keeps on, if you can delve further into American history, you'll go back into pay TV and Star Wars and whatever. We've got, essentially, this is from the policy angle, we've got actually, in my opinion, bandwagon effects occurring here. A very good book by a chap called Rolfs called Bandwagon Effects in Silicon Valley. Bandwagon effects are simply copying effects where people copy others. So policy makers copy other policy makers. And I pose that question to you. Could it be that our governments around the world are seeing that there's something happening here? Oh, we better be on the bandwagon. Let's do it. Let's copy. The worrying thing with copying is you can't be sure always what you're copying. Sometimes you copy the things that you like and you ignore the things that you don't. And copying is difficult because you find it difficult to translate what works well in one area into another area. I know that for a fact. So that's a problem we've got here from history. So historically, e-government poses a very similar problem to, you know, recent history of this enthusiasm of technology and disappointed expectations. So I'm pretty worried at this stage. I'm not convinced this is going to be a good thing. The other thing, as I said, is in the policy process, um, copying is a very prevalent phenomenon. And as I said uh, before, uh, policy makers tend to copy other policy makers. So that those two things operating suggest historically that the government is a, to me, the government should be treated with some degree of circumspection. Okay, I hope I'm being convincing at this point. Um, there's a worry about copying is that at least some recent evidence I read talked about so-called convergence of living standards as a, reduce, as a, as a product of the diffusion of global ICTs. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. So that's some factual, that's not factual, but empirical evidence to suggest that this globalisation process is not pulling us all together. My second point is philosophical. Philosophical. And that is that um, this whole concept of what we call ICT, information communication technologies, and this is an old point, it's not new, that, that we've conf we confabulate or, 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 or confuse the product of information technology with knowledge. We confuse it. And the problem there is um, this problem which has its origins in information science and information studies, uh, the notion that information can be somehow processed by, um, by computers and that this has an output which immediately sort of goes into our minds and this becomes knowledge. It isn't like that at all. I'm being rather crude with that concept, but a rather good book by a chap called Lucas Introner uh, really attacks that information paradigm. I think most of us would be familiar with that. At least the converted in this room would be. Uh, many government policy makers seem to be still learning that lesson. Uh, so we have an information archetype that we're battling. Uh, and uh, that, that's a real problem. It's very prevalent in government thinking. Uh, it's prevalent in, in government decision making and it's been largely driven or has driven a lot of this e-business e, e boom which occurred up until 2000. So that's a real worry. It's even actually pervading the knowledge management literature now which is even more worrisome. So this is IT driven phenomenon. My second point uh, brings about this question of confusion of ends and means. Um, 
we, we tend to see IT as solving all our problems, but, but the point I wish to make there, and it's a point made by Tony Ottinger from Harvard, and it's an important point that, that no matter how much we think IT can do things for us, the essential point of knowledge resides back in ourselves. And, that's, and he's quoting the words here, creative processing of substance to turn raw data into useful knowledge, knowledge remains a monopoly of our flesh and blood minds. And that is always the case. And to me that's a fundamental limitation of e-government. It's the, it's, it's the processing that's occurring in our minds here which is uh, a big problem. So, so very quickly, just to sum up where I've gone so far, the, con- the confusion between ends and means. I think we are confusing what we want out of e-government. We're telling ourselves that through, uh, through ICTs we're going to get this wonderful ends. Wonderful things. ICT is going to deliver all this stuff for us. Democracy and efficiency and, and consultation and better services. But really what we've told ourselves the story, the only story we've told us is that we're using the means to achieve our ends. We're confusing the means with the ends. Historically and philosophically. So that's my point there. I wanted to just make a remark about time before I leave this criticism. So I'm getting away on me now. And... Um, it, it simply is that uh, with respect to time, the OECD thinks all these roadblocks can be just moved to the side. We get rid of all these things like legal impediments. They list a lot of them. Um, these are the things. Legislative inertia, budgetary constraints, government preparedness and the digital divide. Push it all off on the one side and we'll get there. We'll get there. The point is this, and this is, this is I'm quoting now because I, I can only really quote other famous people or people that I think are famous, David and Steinmuller, two very famous economists, they make this point about so-called roadblocks and it's not uncommon in this area. Fixation on the distant technological utopia leads many constituent elements of the existing information system to be viewed as merely a collection of unforeseen roadblocks. Extraneous binding constraints identified as requiring a removal if the computer revolution is to proceed. Beautiful quote. Think about the ambulances, many ambulances that are sent to addresses where people, they've got addresses mixed up, Mount Barker, South Australia, so Mount Barker in Western Australia. I know that story. One went to the wrong address. Think of the soldiers that are getting killed by friendly fire because somebody's seen a blip on a screen and said fire. Think about that. These aren't roadblocks. They're fundamental processing concerns. So that's really, to me, the core of my criticism. As Michel Manu says, the debate, rather than talking about how much ICT should deliver, deliver these promises, he, said, he says the debate should be how far any activity is or will become IT intensive. That, to me, is the question we have here. So as time is running out, how do I proceed with these criticisms? It's good to criticise, but can I give you some value added, so to speak, in going forward? Information perspective um, is a a view, it's a fairly loose, eclectic way of looking at information Um, and and some of the scholars that have advocated this, Kenneth Boulding, uh, Kenneth Arrow, uh, Joe Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winner, happens to be many of economists but they're also broader social philosophers, Um, they look at the role of information in society. They try and value its economic and political worth. That's what I think the, the, the value that I'm adding to this is is, uh, you know, this is where I think I can provide a different perspective here. Uh, Sandra Brahman uh, wrote a, um, a paper some years ago where she provided a sort of taxonomy of information. And she said policymakers can uh, look at this word information from a number of perspectives. It could be a resource, it could be a commodity, uh, it could be part of a broader pattern or it could be part of a constitutive force in society. By that she means the highest level of conceptual view and um, uh, shaping other views of how we look at it. Uh, In fact it's a hierarchy with this fourth point being the highest level in the hierarchy if you like, the most overarching, working its way down. And what she proposes is, for policy makers, she says this, and this is what I try in the paper, I try and do this, she says try and work out what what, what you see information as as your constitutive force. And I think what she's saying there is what sort of society do we want, in, do we want to create? Ask that question first and then start to see how you 
look at information according to these other aspects. I'll just explore that a little bit as time is running out. This is a diagram and it's a, it's a matrix. And if you just, this, I'll take you through this. If you look at information as a resource, it predominantly is resource of something that you use. Okay? It's, it's, it's a thing that's used. It's a resource element. And that generates notions of use and it generates notions of have and have not. Uh, Brahman's ca- commodity concept deals with the transfer of information but also as part of a production chain. So it's production, distribution, use and dissemination of information. That's where it can be conceived. Pattern, uh, according to Brahman, talks about context and uncertainty. When we have context, we reduce uncertainty. Such as the other day when I was waiting for a train. You know damn well that the, uh, if, if there's something wrong with the train or whatever, you, you, you don't believe the, uh, the board, the TV screen. You need context in order to make sense of a timetable. And, and it introduces that element of power there. And finally, constitutive force is the highest level because it provides us standards for judgment and shaping. In this paper, um, I've actually tried to map those against the semantic claims of e-government as put forward by the OECD. And, and uh, I know I'm running out of time here, but I'll give you a sort of an example of um, how that might work. Um, let's pick... Uh, let's pick one here uh, from um, I'll pick this one here uh, I've looked at, let's look at resource and if we take it over resource introduces an element of um, uh, uh, have and have not which is sort of a digital divide concept and you can bring that over to service delivery and community consultation if you like and um, this is a quote from an author called Snellen um, who's done some work in, in e-government and, and, and uh, they say there that governments are eager to develop e-government applications such as one-stop shops, remote voting, websites and the like. Massive allocations of money have been made to realise these applications. However, the online applications are hard to match offline. So indirectly, the digital divide, the imbalance between the level of service provision to computer literates is sharpened. The creation of publicly accessible kiosks and the installation of computers in public libraries are a mere palliative to this inheritance. So by looking at that conceptualisation of information you can start to see that it has an impact on whether you think that promise will be delivered. That's all I'm saying here. I'm actually trying to map it along those lines. this word pattern, let's look at the word pattern here. Uh, that's another interesting example. Um, pattern uh, provides context and uncertainty. However, when we introduce that notion of pattern into government bureau- bureaucracies, we start to see that bureaucracies don't talk to each other. In fact, they see things differently. In fact, if one were to do a study, I suspect, I know from West Australian case, if you were to do a study of government attempts to establish electronic marketplaces for tendering, one would realise that departments don't talk to each other. In fact, they don't want to talk to each other. And you ask yourself the question, why the hell is that? Now, there's all sorts of reasons. Power, bureaucratic silos, mentality, what I mean, people hoard information. They deliberately don't want to share it. But it's even worse still. They can't share it because they don't have the right pattern to share. They actually see it differently. And so there's huge obstacles there for those sort of successful things. I don't know what it's like in Victoria, but in Western Australia, and I had a, a honour student look at this project, we had a thing called GEMS, Government Electronic Marketplace, but it, a couple of years ago it sort of slid under the table and sort of got absorbed and taken off into a couple of other departments. Very conveniently sort of got rid of because departments weren't really happy with it. And you have to ask the question why. Um, so to me... You know, I think Brahman, in her approach to, um, to this whole question, she actually provides us with a framework. But starting with information, you map it out and you say, as a policy maker, what is my image, what is my metaphor for information that I'm using to apply to this e-government movement that I'm trying to, to do or to try and to be a proponent of? And then you, you actually get to... Um, to that sort of conclusion that that really um, will it work or will it won't and and these are some of the challenges that you find.
that's all I'm saying. It's not a, it's not a difficult sort of thing to, um, to conclude. Um, uh, it gets even more deeper as we move down that hierarchy to this, well, to, to the, this point here where we get into the questions of democracy and questions of the way people think. That's probably the hardest of all. Uh, to deal with because I'm afraid that with information overload and things like that we invariably know how we search desperately for simplification for complexity and politicians shovel it out to us and we love it because that's what we survive and if we make sense of the world that way that's a political, a political dilemma that I think is virtually impossible to overcome and the information archetype of more information more information pile it up and you'll become knowledgeable it just doesn't make any sense and that's a conundrum that, or not only a conundrum it's a, it's a limitation that I think is um, uh, remarkable and fixed a quote from a 1967 pa- a paper by Schubick uh, says yes in fact it's all been said before what how many years ago we're going close to 30 years ago he says now yes technology will change us and it will change democratic processes but he makes a challenging comment he said that uh, if we want to live in a, a free society and a sophisticated society. The challenge simply is that we need sophisticated individual members of that society and that the challenge is to change ourselves as opposed to change systems of government. I think that's the biggest challenge. As I said, flesh and blood mind. That's where I think we're confronted with this um, thing. So in conclusion then, um, let me just say that um, my main points are firstly, I think history is against us. History is a tremendous teacher. Tremendous teacher. And we continue to ignore it. And I've I've actually spent my life looking at historical developments in policy, particularly technology policy. And I can assure you this doesn't look too different to what I saw in the 80s. I've been around that long too, that's when I was studying this stuff. It's ain't too different. Is it going to bring change? Yes, it will. It'll bring changes in ways that we hadn't dreamt of. Why? Because I suspect, for two reasons, we have underestimated the costs. I think we've underestimated the intransigence of these limitations and I think we underestimate the time factor involved as well. I think those three factors suggest to me that things will go in ways that we probably are pretty unsure about at the moment. And uh, Michael Kirby, the High Court Justice quoting the American Civil Liberties Union recently said, we're being confronted, this is my concluding point, we really, e-government presents us with this point, we continue to be confronted with fundamental choices about the sort of society we want to live in. And that still is the challenge. That still is the challenge. My only hope to you this afternoon is that by looking and taking this angle, looking at information, and to some extent knowledge, and mapping it out, and asking yourselves as policy makers, where does it fit in? What am I trying to do when I pose that e-government question with my angle on information? What are the challenges it, um, it presents us with? And the most important comes back to here. What sort of society do we want to live in? What sort of society do we want to create? Let's start with that first. The time's against us. As I said, it's imperative we adopt these systems now, according to the OECD. So I'll finish with that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much for that, uh, Richard. And um, I'll call for, uh, for questions and bring our two speakers back. Maybe Richard will stay on the radio mic to respond to questions and Alison might come up here. Two papers, I must say, to warm the heart of a, um, uh, a, a man posing as a political scientist uh, in his current contract. Uh, pluralism, uh, lovely discussion. Kenneth Arrow, legitimacy. It's all you know, wonderful discussions that we've had and what I, what I think these two papers have put out is how these issues of technology have really come and touched upon those old long-standing debates. The way in which uh, e-democracy and e-governments has been used to mask um, a, a discourse about high modernism over the last uh, five years has been really fascinating. And, uh, you know, we, we see uh, public servants, we see academics talking about the use of technology in governance functions like it simply is uh, the way in which all redundancy in society and in government can be eliminated. 
and, um, and I think these two papers have wonderfully challenged uh, the assumptions underlying first the notion of democracy and what is democracy. And I think Alison's paper for me really touched on the issue of representativeness and what, it, what we actually mean by representativeness. I mean, one of the, the fundamental kind of things about Dalian style pluralism uh, way back when, you know, from the Who Governs days of the, the study of New Hampshire, was the assumption that a large part of the population are happy and we know they're happy because they don't participate the apolitical strata, and then coming into Richard Joseph's paper, really unpacking uh, the notion of information and talking about political systems as information systems and, and really starting to unpack that. So um, if I could bring the two speakers back, uh, Alison to the podium and Richard to hover around to answer questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, questions, please. So... I couldn't agree more. I, I'm being a little bit simpl simplified, no. simplifying, you know, just to make a point in the paper. But uh, there's a, a, a very, very good article. I was just part way through it last night by a chap called Max Boisot, B O I S O T, in the Journal of Evolutionary Economics, where he's looking at the way information is used in different sort of forms of economic discourse. Uh, you know, uh, orthodox economics, institutional economics, and I, I'd recommend that to you. That's in just a, the latest issue of that journal. So it does take that issue forward a little bit as to, as he says, he, he says, we, we've really made a mess of this word information. I couldn't agree more. It's a, it's a big area. And it's, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to fathom it out. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Hi, yeah. This is um, thanks for the I was going to talk some more um, points um, in the, my industry. The, you you emphasize a lot the complexity of democracy. I wasn't sure at that when you're actually what you're referring to the, the concept of democracy. One way you could look at it is actually the concept of democracy has actually become anti-simplified, in which there's actually various actually different um, groups for that. So it's actually the concept of that has been empty, and then it's refilled by. Um, various um, notions of what democracy means if you follow a sort of physical theory type approach. And another um, point, probably one I'm more interested, I like how you sort of develop and look at and try to pull apart the various um, models within the discourse of e-democracy. I like how you talk about a discourse of e-democracy because I think there is actually a way in which e-democracy has become framed by various rules and um, of what democracy is, so you sort of take the notion of democ um, discourse, I'm not sure what notion of discourse you're actually taking. If you've taken a notion of discourse as, um, then you actually have three models within a discourse, a liberal discourse, and all pointing towards a, a um, liberal consumer style discourse. Um, so they all actually fit within this, this discourse. But there are actual models outside the discourse that actually various writers are pointing to, um, which, for instance, there are. Uh, so the libertarian model, which were much, were much earlier um, you know, in the early 90s. But there are also type of communist models or um, autonomous Marxist models which have been promoted. There are radical democracy models which have been promoted. And these are all models that have actually been sidelined by a lot of the people and a lot of the academics who are focusing on e-democracy in particular being sidelined because a lot of the e-democracy discourses coming out of the United States and out of political science and sociology and whatever in the in mainstream political science and sociology, and I think there's something that's conference must focus on that actually perpetuates um, very strong and dominant models of democracy, and therefore it doesn't transform what democracy is, it doesn't transform society, because all that, what happens, and I think this is what you're actually pointing out, actually, is that all that happens is that academics re re um, perpetuate um, dominant, dominant and dominant discourses. Um, so I think your work is really, really important. I'm wondering whether it would be strengthened by actually showing sort of, um, discourses, the way that discourses about democracy um, outside this dominant liberal democracy, 
the school teachers in the dock are actually being marginalized, so to speak. No, actually, that's a fantastic point. I'm going to speak to you about it more later. Um, that would be a good way to take take it further. The idea that people are using this to to justify pretty much their own claims, and they're really taking what they want in order to do that, and to to uh, focus on um, democracy discourse that is outside the mainstream would be another way to look at that. That would that's actually a really good idea. I could take it further with that. I might come and speak to you about that in a minute. <laughs> So, I was pleased to your discussion. It's great. It's just, this might seem a little wet still, but I also think it's relevant to interesting comment from you. There's an assumption often that once people participate in this or internet discussion that it's open, I would argue there are words. But the globalisation of defamation law is actually closing debate in internet, internet discussion groups. Particularly important is the fact that if they're archived, people can feel incredibly restricted in saying something or writing something because it's going to be set in a sense of digital stone. The issue might be resolved at some time in the future, but readers, other people might think that there's still an argument or a conflict happening there. And because when something's set in digital stone, there's the possibility, a much greater possibility, of being vulnerable to prosecution or legal action. Um, particularly from other countries, as it's happened in Australia with Joe Pitney, stirring Forbes magazine, mm -hmm. these kinds of things, and there are increasing uh, prisons just around the world. Would you like to comment upon this as a, a way in which e-democracy may actually close off discussion, political discussion? Yeah, it's, it's a very good point, and again, it comes back to the idea that people are not having a, a broad understanding of, of how this can affect democracy because if people think that we'll encourage people to become involved, they're not getting involved now so what we'll do is we'll actually set up this, this online forum and they'll get involved that way um, and providing that to be the only avenue and if you do that suddenly you're making people participate and you're, you're providing avenues for participation and you're, you're exactly right, they can be monitored and there is, I mean in a lot of countries there is a sort of understanding of self-censorship because they know they know that somebody's watching, and yeah, that it never goes goes anywhere. It will be there. And um, actually, I was reading this Amnesty International thing about um, a guy who was posting in China, and he started to post about some ideas. Um, he lost his son in on, in Tiananmen Square, and he set up a site to pour his heart out, so to speak. And people started uh, writing him writing emails back into him and it actually turned into a forum. Finally, um, the government came and arrested him and the final words that were on the, the forum actually said, they're coming for me. And that was it. And then they arrested him and he was gone. As far as I know, he's still in jail. But yeah, the idea that somebody is watching you is, is very strong. And even in a democracy, I would say that that's probably the case. <laughs> Yeah, the, the conflict between um, the idea of an internet facilitated direct democracy and the rule of law is something that I have written on briefly. I've taken it out of this because there just wasn't enough time. But yeah, again, it's something that doesn't come up that I have found yet. I'm still looking um, in the e-democracy discourse because um, keeping our current inst institutions, as you say, you could end up in a situation where you've brought about direct democracy initiatives so that people can 
give their opinion through a poll on a particular issue, the government then says, OK, well, let's do that because the majority wants it. But suddenly the, the courts override it because it's unconstitutional. And it, again, it brings up that problem of min minorities versus majorities that really isn't solved by the technology. And it, again, it's showing that, that conflict and the complexity of it because it isn't something that's discussed and it really does need to be because it, it's a reality. If you did this, that would be a problem. Yeah, so it is, yeah, it's something I want to look into further, yeah. Edelman's had a big impact on me because I picked him up when I was doing my PhD but uh, in that thesis I harked back some 20 years at that point but we've got a deficit in industrial policy in this country and uh, we've got a very weak industrial structure it's becoming evident now balance of trade is going sort of through the floor and things like that and ICTs you know, and all the rest of it uh, our response to, um, to that, the government's response which is predominantly Labor was to have sunrise industries and set up technology parks and <laughs> things like that I mean um, we've been doing it ever since. It's a, it's a, it's a way of um, uh, demonstrating legitimacy when you've got the intractable policy problem which will not go away. It's, it's not something you'll ever solve. It'll make that point. Um, he wrote a latter book, um, there was Symbolic Politics, which was about the mid-60s, and there was one about 74, which said um, a political language, uh, words that succeed and policies that fail. It's a beautiful title, and that's what I think we live in this country. We live it every day. And that's why I've become a cynic when it comes to e-government. We're living the same thing. I've seen too much of it. I've been around too long to think this will be any different. It's not a good, not, not, it's not a very nice way to, to comment on it, but it, um, I've become a very, very cynic. NOE, for example, the, the, the National Office of the Information Economy, um, I've looked at that work over the last year or so, and, and uh, I know I actually wrote a paper last year talking about an actual portrayal of misinformation, let alone information policy, it's misinformation policy. That's how bad it is. The public has a perception, and, and I deal with this every day, mm. that the information, the electronic information world is transparent. You can find things when you go and look for them. Mm. This doesn't turn out to be the case. Mm. It's just as difficult in many situations to find information electronically as it is to find it in the old print technology. Mm. Um, also, things disappear. Um, you know, the same way as a book can go out of print and disappear, pages just disappear off the web. Mm. I know this for a fact, I deal with it every day. Mm. Um, so that there are inherent limitations within the technology itself. Much of it has been on the agenda for governments to look at things like archiving and all sorts of other things, but it hasn't been taken up. Um, and it's one of those things where a large amount of money, a large amount of consultation, huge amounts of work have to go in there to make it a viable long-term proposition, mm. and that doesn't appear to be happening. Mm. Is that another one of those limitations of that OECD report mm. may have said that we could just, you know, bulldoze out of the way? Right. I, 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 I agree. Um, one thing I didn't achieve in the paper, which when I wrote the abstract I wanted to do, was actually to look at the role of information in the policy process. And um, uh, A book written in the 60s by a chap called Harold Walensky called Organisational Intelligence looked at some of those issues, actually how information is used within government. And those things come up all the time, such as one of his aphorisms was uh, information. Uh, uh, time is the, is the, is the uh, enemy of information. And what that simply means is the quicker you need a decision, 
the lesser government policy maker is going to go and search information on, out on a particular topic. So you've got those immediate tensions, time and information. What about the problem of power? When governments make, already make decisions and they just bring in consultants to make post hoc uh, sort of justifications. To me, that's exactly what you're talking about. So this whole physical question of stuff just disappearing and falling off the, you know, organisational memory loss. I mean, we're living it too. You know, people get sacked, so organisational tacit knowledge just goes out the door with them. No, they are problems. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Maybe forgetting things can be good sometimes. But I, I agree with you. They are they are limitations in a big way. I didn't touch on those, but that, that's another almost a, an organisational learning problem that has to be addressed with uh, by in, in this ICT environment too. Yeah, you agree? Yeah, it does go back to, to the to mm. the personal, to the fact that you have to have the skills, you mm. have to have mm. the ability. It's not just a digital divide, it's, mm. a, it's a knowledge divide as well. Mm. You have to have the ability mm. to extract that information mm. out of a system. It doesn't matter whether it's print, it doesn't matter whether it's electronic. Yeah. Uh, in the diagram I use the word capability yeah. and I treat that as a, you know, are you capable to do certain things and are you capable to understand even if I'm talking to you, you know. It, that's another thing. Am I capable to understand? You know, they're all sort of things to do with communication and sharing of information. A lot of people aren't capable. Simple fact. Yeah, um, how do you go to University of Canberra? Yeah. Um, I mean, I really liked your talk that you did about um, different aspects, you know, the different metaphors and and what's coming across in these different meanings of the word information. Um, But there's there's a sense in which um, some of of the work that uh, that I've been doing is looking at um, uh, information really only has meaning in local context, Mm -hmm. like a very local kind of level context. um, I mean, even think talking about extracting information, and you know, I mean, there's also the problem of, of who, who's cleaning information on the web. We're talking about the government, you know, what what, what, what information is, is there for people to find? Who's going to be interested in it? You know, what segments of the population and who's not going to find anything that they care about or that grabs them or and so on. So, I just wondered if in looking at these metaphors, if you if you come across kind of metaphors that try and because it's countering the dominant trend, which is to put information as universal, and the more of it we've got, the better, and we can stack it all up like bricks in the wall and, and get better decisions and a better society. But if we if we disaggregate that universalism and sort of get it down to being you know local packages that fit into local contexts that don't all fit together, that you know pull things in different directions. And that's giving a very different view of kind of information. And I'm just wondering if in the e government literature you've seen those kind of metaphors being used at all. Mm. And uh, um, because I think it does counter that kind of. Um, no, I, I don't profess to be knowledgeable of e-government literature. But what I have read, I don't see it. Um, that point is picked up by Ottinger from the Harvard Program of Information Policy, uh, where he talks about that simple phrase, IT sometimes helps. I know it's a shorthand phrase, but it is that exact point about context and substance coming together. So, as I said, if you know there's a snowstorm and you see you're in an airport and you see on the monitor that your plane is leaving on time, you know full well that something ain't right. And it's that putting the two together that I think Ottinger talks about and I think that can be extended to that local, global question too. I, th- I think it fits nicely, but no, not specifically, I haven't seen it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was thinking of the health kind of area. You know, I mean, one of the contestations between government and, and uh, doctors, for instance, who've got a bit of the power to make their voice heard, yeah. uh, but we're still going to warehouse our general practitioner records. Yeah. Uh, is, you know, well, you know, what I scribble down on a piece of paper in the doctor's surgery has local kind of meaning. Mm. And what can be taken from that if it's kind of put in this strict context, yes. and that's the kind of question I guess, but yes. I think yes. we have to start addressing this. It's a big worry, yeah, I agree. Sorry, just sort of picking up on those couple of points about data information knowledge mm-hmm. and how that feeds into government policy. I mean, I think one of the things that very often information is, is uh, when information is extracted, Translation into knowledge happens in the policy writer's head. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that word. 
what actually comes out the other end as a policy is not necessarily always what's adopted. And very often, the government policy maker or the government who implements policy will look back at the information to make sure that they're just the right position. So, it's sort of a, 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 to a degree, a different process, and what actually ends up on the web in terms of what's published as the information will very often be culled uh, and paired down to what's basically essential just to make sure that that particular position is substantiated and that never never twain should be confused the information is in fact knowledge and is the only validation for the communication position. It's called, I think, I don't know whether Edelman calls it the shifting goalpost phenomenon. Is it, is it something in his book? But it's fine, that's how I think of it. The governments set out policy objectives and they, they implement policy and then when it comes to review it, they actually change their objectives so they always kicking the ball through the goalposts even if things have changed. Right. Um, yeah. I can just give a quick example. Yeah. So, to me, one of the classics, I think, was Boston, seven bridges yeah. across the river. Legislation said that basically this is the standard for a condemned bridge. So all seven bridges were identified as being condemned, so they didn't have to make the fix until they should change the standard so no one was condemned to make the fix. Yeah. <laughs> Could you take your concepts and apply it to the uh, recent situation of the information flow called intelligence that's been coming in and how it's filtered through also yeah. where we've got to? I think you could. Um, but I think overlaying that is the power question. I think power has a distorting effect on the information flow, as we all know. But, um, yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. Um, I, I refer you back to... Um, to uh, Walensky in the, in the mid-60s who did a very comprehensive book on um, decision-making about strategic bombing in the United States. It's predominantly mil- military metaphors. Now, I know it's 30 years old or, or so, but uh, he, he did a pretty good job on looking at um, how information is handled within government processes in, in, with the military metaphors. It's, uh, it's a nice read. And a well-known um, political scientist of his time in the intelligence community, Walensky. You're probably familiar with him and all, yeah. I'm just saying I think you could but I haven't applied Brahman to that but I'm, I'm quite excited about Brahman I think uh, I think you know she made the claim in 89 and uh, to me it's a rather neat little way of assessing the policy makers how to look at reflect on what they're doing when they're making policy and you think there are solutions to fix what we've just gone through so that we can avoid the continuing one would, one would have, I, I don't think we'll ever, ever escape the fact that IT sometimes helps I think that's part of <laughs> Part of the problem, the famous economist Macklet wrote a three-page paper on the optimality of information use and it was written, I think, in the early 70s but it left me with the view that we're all, it's, it's constantly sort of the more we move this way, the more we lose the other way. It's almost an uncertainty principle. Um, uh, the more we want to gain in codified knowledge, the more we tend to lose in tacit knowledge. Uh, it's, it's that tension between the two. We can never achieve that complete information. Uh, what Van Bush Bush wanted in the 40s, um, it, it's, it's, it's a hope that will never be delivered. And that's why Ottinger wrote the paper. He said the, um, uh, the uh, knowledge, um, uh, the, it was called the agony and ecstasy of knowledge innovation. That was a, 90, a 2001 piece, a Harvard, Harvard chap, but well known in information policy studies. Agony and ecstasy, we live with that. That's our human lot. I think. Well, we might, uh, I might take my, uh, my position as chair and say thank you both very much. Um, one of the interesting things that, that occurs to me is what Paul Sabatia has written on in the kind of US policy context is talking about belief systems and the way in which people encounter information across deep core and secondary kind of aspects to their belief and value systems and filter that through. It applies to the way we see democracy and the word democracy is used all the time. It's also used as a club, isn't it? To make sure that we don't have democracy to mess you up. But um, I found those papers like, extremely fascinating. If we could thank our two speakers once again. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to do it.
Okay, so, are you in this room next? Yeah, I'm in this room next. Tomorrow, 11. Oh, yes, sorry, you came in late. Um, yes, he says his apologies, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. So you're on tomorrow in this room? Uh, yes, we can do that now. And oh, okay. Right. Now, who do I want to see? See, point him to? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, so bring it to the That's Yeah, I'm going to 